Hey everybody, this is, uh, I want to welcome y'all to the second episode of the Songbirds Radio Hour. I'm Zoe, and this is the Vanguard, my band, like, they sound great, right? So tonight, we have special guest Richard Lloyd, but first, me and the band are going to play the song Just Like a Star by Kareem Bailey Ray. Are y'all ready? like a star across my sky just like an angel off the page you have appeared to my life feel like I'll never be the same just like a song in my heart just like oil on my hands honor to love Still I wonder why it is I don't argue like this With anyone but you We do it all the time Going out my mind You got this look I can't describe you made me feel like I'm alive When everything else is okay With you by my side I'll be alright Heaven has been way too long Can't find the words to write this song Oh, your love Still I wonder why it is I don't argue like this with anyone but you we do it all the time going out my mind da 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 I've come to understand the way it's not a secret anymore cause we've been through that before from tonight I know that you're the only one It's not a difference anymore Now I understand Yeah, yeah Da 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 da
Reed Caldwell. Y'all give another round of applause for our great house band, Zoe and the Vanguard. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Songbirds Radio Hour. We've got a hell of a show for you tonight. We've got legendary guitarist from the band Television, Richard Lloyd. <laughs> Shortly, we'll do an interview with Richard and then a Q&A, uh, and then he'll perform several of Television's biggest hits with our house band, Zoe and the Vanguard. But before we get to Television, let's talk about how the guitar gave voice to the masses and punk rock provided a new way to rebel and voice dissent. One, two, so the staff and I argued about where to start this conversation about punk. John said the Stooges. I argued for MC5. Charlie fought for the New York Dolls. And we agreed that maybe we should just roll back the decades and look at an unlikely proto-punk rocker, the Dust Bowl troubadour himself, Woody Guthrie. There's a great and a bloody fight around this whole world tonight In the battle of bombs and shrapnel rain Hitler told the world around he would tear our union down But our union's gonna break down slavery chains And our union's gonna break You might ask yourself, how is old folksy pants Guthrie a punk rocker? Well, Woody wrote powerful songs that discuss topics like inequality and social injustice he exposed corporate greed and fought government corruption. And it's not an easy task to quickly sum up his impact on music, but he demonstrated his punk cred by scrawling a simple statement on his guitar. This machine kills fascists. That short, poignant statement is a metaphor for the power of the guitar. The guitar may just be a simple combination of wood and wire and bits of plastic and metal, but it is a weapon of change a weapon that has shattered barriers, sparked revolutions, and given power to the masses. A decade or so after Woody's heyday, the electric guitar in the hands of artists like Sister Rosetta Tharp, Chuck Berry, and Link Ray helped create a new sound, rock and roll, a genre that shook up the establishment and gave a voice to a generation. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, we saw the rise of rock's younger, angrier sibling, punk. And where rock and roll may have given us a voice, punk taught us how to rebel. The electric guitar was ideal for punk. It was relatively inexpensive, highly portable, and best of all, it was ridiculously loud. Punk wasn't exactly a subgenre of rock, it was more than that. 
It was a movement, a movement that embodied the anger and the frustration of kids in the 1970s and gave them a way to fight against the establishment and reject the status quo. Punk was anti-everything, anti-globalization, anti-gentrification, anti-racism, anti-authoritarianism. And while the Sex Pistols' God Save the Queen illuminated the corruption of the British monarch and the alienation of the British youth, Sham 69's ripoff denounced capitalism and corporate greed. The dead Kennedys spoke out against fascism and totalitarianism, while the clash addressed weighty topics like violence, hate, racism, greed, and wealth inequality. These bands had a huge impact on the punk movement, but there's another band that was just as influential. Picture this, you're planning to attend a show at a small club in Manhattan's East Village in 1974. The club had a white awning with bright red letters that read C-B-G-B, which stood for country, bluegrass, and blues. So you thought you'd have a nice night out, and of course, you took the sign at its word, and you showed up in your Stetsons and your Wrangler jeans ready to boot scoot, and you stepped through the door and you realized, this ain't no honky tonk. On stage, you see four guys with disheveled hair, ripped t-shirts, and black leather jackets playing stripped down, guitar-driven rock with a dash of jazz improv and a splash of the Velvet Underground. So, you quickly ditch your bejeweled duds and your 10-gallon hat, and you grab a beer and you bang your head along with Tom Verlaine, Richard Lloyd, Billy Ficka, and Richard Hell, otherwise known as the band Television. They were a fixture at CBGB's playing regular gigs there with the likes of Patti Smith, the Dead Boys, Blondie, the Ramones, the Talking Head, and the Cramps, solidifying the club as the place for hardcore music for the next two decades. Television's album Marquee Moon is one of the defining albums from the punk era. Richard Lloyd's and Tom Verlaine's dueling guitars intertwine clangy chords, twangy riffs, and clean, airy guitar lines to create an iconic album with this spacey atmosphere and a unique sound that has since inspired hundreds of guitarists. Rolling Stone put the title track of Marquee Moon at number 41 on their 2004 Greatest Guitar Songs of All Time. We are so proud to have Richard Lloyd with us tonight. We're going to have an interview segment with him soon, and we're going to let you, the audience, ask him some questions. So get yours ready now. But before we get to all that good stuff, let's hear another tune from Zoe and the Vanguard. Gonna get in your way One day All them bags 
gon' get in your way. One day, all them bags gon' get in your way. One day, all them bags gon' get in your way. So, back life. You can't hurry up, cause you got too much stuff. When they see it coming, they take off running from you. It's true, oh yes they do. One day, all them bags gon' get in your way. One day, all them bags gon' get in your way. One day, all them bags gon' get in your way. One day, all them rays gonna get in your way. So, back life. Mmm, back life. So, back life. Back life. I bet you wonder where I've been. Search to find love within. I came back to let you know. Got a thing for you, and I can't let it go. My friends wonder what is wrong with me. But it's true, love, can't you see? I just want to let you know. Think for you, and I can't let it go. Bag lady, you gon' hurt your back, dragging all them bags like that. I guess nobody ever told you all that you hold on to is you, is you, is you. One day, all them bags gon' get. One day, all them bags gon' get in your way. One day, all them bags gon' get in your way. One day, all them bags gon' get in your way. So, back life. Mmm, back life. So, back life. You're listening to the Songbirds Radio Hour. Dang, that was smooth. I felt good. Hey, uh, y'all give it up. We're so lucky to have this awesome house band holding down the fort for, during all the intermissions and breaks. <clears throat> now here's what you've all been waiting for. Please help me welcome the co-founder and guitarist of the band television, as well as an author, singer-songwriter, and all-around badass Richard Lloyd. Well, let's just start off with something that I think every interview starts off with, which is let's talk about your musical influences. Who, what bands really inspired you to do what you do? None. None. <laughs> That's a great answer. I like it. Yeah. All right. Well, something had to fill up the silence. <laughs> I like silence. Considering your role in the punk movement, do you consider yourself a punk guitarist? 
It wasn't called punk till they, uh, people from Connecticut came down and started the magazine Punk. One of the artists, John Holstrom, brought down this drunk named Legs McNeil, and the two of them started Punk Magazine, and that was the beginning of journalists having something to put us all in the same barrel, yeah. as it were. And I feel like television doesn't really fit in that well, barrel. Well, we were, because you we guys were, were terrible when we started. <laughs> Really, really awful. We sounded like the Sex Pistols on a bad night in 74. So talk a little bit about forming television. So you started off as a bad band, but how did you guys meet and how did you kind of get started in the scene? Uh, I was living in Chinatown with a guy who was uh, part of the Andy Warhol crowd. And he said, um, there's a guy in town who does what you do. And I got insulted. I said, what do you mean? What do you think I do? He says, well, you, you don't do anything except you play guitar by yourself all day and all night. <laughs> I said, well, why would I want to go see somebody do what I do since I'm better off doing it? But the day came and I broke a string and I agreed to go see this guy who was doing a three-song audition. Uh, so that was Tom Miller, who became Tom Verlaine. And uh, when he went on doing his three songs, I thought to myself, well, he's missing something, and what he's missing is something I have. And if you put the two of us together, you'd have something. You, uh, Terry was the guy in the Warhol circle. and. Uh, he wanted to do what Andy did, that is, have a band like Andy had to Velvet Underground. And he was going to put one around me. And when I saw Tom, I said, well, forget putting a band around me. Just put me and him together, and you'll have a history. You'll have something worth doing. And so uh, he talked to them, and he and Richard uh, Myers, knee hell, came down to talk to me. And uh, after talking and passing the guitar back and forth, uh, Tom and myself, uh, we decided we would give it a shot. So that's how. Well, it worked out, I would say. And then Terry, since he wanted to manage a band, he bought us amplifiers. So we didn't have nothing. Yeah. Did we buy you some supers? What, did you get a super we, What we were anti was anti-glamour and anti-money. Clearly, we were very anti-money. So Terry bought us amplifiers, and that started it. So talk a little bit about how the, the, those dual guitar lines kind of intertwine. You know, they're, 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 television is these two guitar lines that kind of offset, battle each other, but yet somehow they come together and form this really unique yeah. kind of... It's atmosphere. intricate, is what it is. It's not hap-dash, it's very intricate. So, I don't know if you'd call that punk or not, but certainly we looked the part. We were anti-glamour. So, you know, we wore old, old clothes. We went to a place down in Chinatown where there were piles of clothes for like 50 cents shirts and pants, and we outfitted ourselves in that, in those. Did you have any idea that you might be creating a style? <laughs> yeah, style. yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> you create no a style of music, a style of clothing, and all that stuff. Just there's no use in false modesty. It, uh, it's pride doing a headstand. I can agree with that. So when you, I mean, at the time, I'm sure CBGBs didn't seem like this iconic thing that it would become, but just talk a little bit about being the housebound there and some of the shows you may have performed and what well, was it like? Uh... We rehearsed in Chinatown, and to get there, you had to go through the Lower East Side. And we were sitting around talking, and there was absolutely no place in New York where you could play original music. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted it. And uh, every once in a while, they'd, they'd get one gig as an opening act for a national act coming through, but that was like once every six months. And if you play once every six months, you're never gonna get off the ground. 
So we were talking about getting a place where we could be the house band. And one day Tom came down and he said, I may have seen a place because there was a guy working on an awning outside of this crummy bar in front of a flop house. And uh, you want to come up with me and we'll, maybe we'll talk to the guy, see if he's going to have music. And that turned out to be CBGB's. So we went in there and uh, claimed that we played country, bluegrass, blues, and a little rock. A little rock. And he said, well, we're not going to have any rock in here. <laughs> and, uh, Famous and, last words. And uh, I said, or, or Tom, Tom said, well, that's cool. We don't, it's like nothing you've ever heard before. It's nothing like what you think of when you think of a rock band. It's something else completely. So he gave us a chance, and our man, Terry, went to him and he said, what's your worst night, you know, where you make no money, and it was Sunday. So he said, well, let, let my guys play there on a Sunday, and I will guarantee that I will invite all my friends, and they're all alcoholics. <laughs> so you'll make more money at the bar than you would on a, on a Saturday, you know, on Sunday. So he's, he couldn't fight that, so we got to play. And, you know, we were awful. <laughs> and people came to see us. Well, that's, that's what it takes, you know. I feel like that's, that's super interesting because I was going to ask you a little bit more about, you know, how you changed his mind from the CBGB and what it stands for to, and it sounds like you just got on an off night. Maybe you were terrible at that time, but then you became no, the something kid, else. The kids came in and steamrolled Hilly, that was the owner of the bar. I mean, we made, television made up the rules, mm -hmm. which were, he would do the bar and we would make money off the door. It was $2 admission. And we hired uh, pretty girls to sit in the front and take the money and a, and a pretty good counter, somebody to make sure nobody got in for free. Mm -hmm. Except if you played there, you got in for free. So as people came in and played there, then they formed an audience for the next guy. And we had a rule about only two bands a night, each playing two sets. And that was basically from the Beatles in Hamburg having to play five sets all night. We were like, how can we play more so we can get better? Mm -hmm. And that was one of the ideas, not to have eight bands in a night but to have two bands play twice each, mm -hmm. like a double feature movie. Right. They used to be double feature movies, not anymore. Mm -hmm. Boo-hoo. Yeah. yeah. Who knew that our Who knew that our attention spans would grow to you know shrink <laughs> to, <laughs> to shrink to, to, to silence. Oh uh, no, it's just uh, it's kind of it's kind of crazy. I mean, so do you remember any of those like early shows, like when you had another band opening up for you that just really stuck with you? Is there somebody, some band that you just really remember, like oh, I've seen? Sure. It. Talking Heads, Blondie, Ramones, they all came down, Talking Heads, they came down. We did a lot of shows with them opening. And, uh, you know, there's two bands playing two sets a night. So if you got to see the other band, even if you got there late, let's say I didn't want to go to the first set, I'd see them third. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which would be first for me. Right, yeah. <laughs> B-52s, they were part of a second wave, bands like that, mm -hmm. so. I just, I'm trying to wrap my head around what it would be like to show up and see you guys, for one, and then see, like, someone open up for you, like, the Talking Heads or, you know, one of those bands. It just sounds like an amazing, yeah. it's just amazing when those kind of things, they start from this regular thing, like, hey, we were just a band that maybe weren't, we were just kind of, kind of coming up and we decided to, to play this place. It's hard to compute that you can just create a whole movement. How does that, does that, would you ever think about it that way? Like we played, of course. This, we played this show and then, and then all of a sudden it became this whole thing. And you've got like, I mean, literally hundreds of bands that I know uh, people probably out here that are in bands that are, were influenced by television. Like, what is it? How does that feel? It feels fine. <laughs> <laughs> Real good. In fact. Yeah. But that's what I tell people. They say, how can I make it? And they say, get your own place to play and uh, have people show up <laughs> and just keep doing it, you know? But yeah. get your own scene. Yeah. Don't like try to glom onto some other scene. 
it was impossible to get business people down to CBGB's because, like I said, it was uh, the bottom floor, it was street level, and on the second floor was a real flop house. Cost a dollar sixty-five for a night in a dorm-type setting, mm -hmm. and uh, there'd be always be like bums passed out in front of the club, and you'd have to step over them. So all the fancy people from it took like a year and a half to get people with any clout in the business to come down and see us, mm -hmm. and uh, it was tough and. We weren't the first band to get signed. Uh, we turned record companies down. We turned Island down. We turned uh, Capital down, although we did a record for them later on. We turned record companies down because they wanted to produce us. And we, didn't, we knew what we wanted to sound like. So where did you, where did you guys, where did you record the album? You know... Tom picked the studio, and I asked him why that place, because it had a really antiquated board, recording uh, board, and I'll go all technical now. if you. That's uh, fine. Go all technical. We were, but, you know, we were it, it, it was a Neve board, but with, like, instead of, uh, it looked like helicopter controls on it, and it was curved, and you would push the riders up and back, that way, and uh, but the room was shaped like the room we rehearsed in. It was just like like a rectangle. Well, um, I think we're wrapping up the interview. We're gonna do have you play with the house band. You guys have been rehearsing this week. It's been awesome. The it's Vanguard. Awesome. Yeah, I'm just so Thanks glad you're here with us, Somers. I know all these people are glad. Yeah, let's give Richard a round of applause there. You're listening to the Songbirds Radio Hour. The way uh, the first al television album opens with this song called See No Evil. <laughs> Gonna leave the room 
Cause what I want, I want now. And it's a whole lot more. Tame and mouth. I understand all no. destructive urges. No. They seem so perfect. I, I see, I see no. the future with the one that you love. I'm running wild with the one that I love. Put down the future, baby. Put down the future now. Put down the future with the one that you love. I'm running wild with the one that I love. And the title track of that is called Marquee Moon. It goes like this. You're listening to the Songbirds Radio Hour. Get in, get in.
ain't the marquee moon. I ain't waiting. No, no. Thank you, Vanguard. Zarina oh, wow. Vanguard. Okay. Woo. Pretty good. Two rehearsals. <laughs> this happened again for Richard Lloyd. He did amazing. You're listening to the Songbirds Radio Hour. Well, I can't believe that just happened. I mean, how many, how many cuss words does WTC give me to sum up how amazing something is per episode? Do we... John says I have two, but I think I've already used those. So I just, I can't, if you had told me when we came up with the idea for the Songbirds Radio Hour, that during our second episode, our house band will be playing Marky Moon with Richard Lloyd, I wouldn't have believed it. What a night. Y'all give another round of applause for Richard, Zoe, and the Vanguard. All right, so now it's time for you, the audience, to ask a few questions. There's a question over there. In the course of a normal 24-hour day, 
day and night. When do you feel like playing the most and why? Uh, I keep a guitar by my side at all times and I'll play for five minutes or half an hour or 10 minutes or one minute and it's there so I can pick it up and play. I play probably three to six hours a day if you added it all up. Is that it? Three, three to six hours. That's amazing. 36 hours 36 in hours. each 12 hour period. I like that, that's good. <laughs> I'm ambitious. <laughs> Slightly ambitious. Um, uh, what, what grade strings do you use, Richard? Uh, 10 through 46, really regular slinky. Ernie Ball, they send them to me, it's free. Free strings. No, but I, I used to pay for them. Those are the ones I like. Next question. So how did you come to be in Chattanooga? I like it. It's nice and quiet. It's very beautiful. And uh, I get to drive because I, I didn't even have a license till I was over 40. Because I grew up in Manhattan and there a, a car is a curse. Here it's a necessity. Here you need to take a car to your car. <laughs> or across the street to visit your friend. I saw a question back there in the back. Somewhere, right there in the viewer. Hey, do you still teach? Uh, not lately. Do I do, but do you, do you it comes and goes in spurts. Do you want to? Do I want to? Yeah. Eh. Come on, Richard. It depends on the, the gravity of the student situation. What if it's the Steve? <laughs> no, I thought Richard Hell came in spurts. Many things come in spurts. <laughs> we won't comment anymore on that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, Richard. I, I just moving the conversation along. No, no. Yeah. Then I joke back. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, Richard. Yeah. Yeah. So you are such an influential figure for so many people, and I was just wondering, what was there a, a certain uh, set of musicians that were particularly inspiring to you in, in New York at that period around the? Well, you know, I grew up in New York, and so I was extremely fortunate because there were guitar players, you know, on every corner, oh. and uh, all the greats I I got to see live as or be in the dress, you know, you didn't have security the way they have it now. Yeah. So if you got to a show, you'd just go to the back stage, and oft times then they wouldn't know that you weren't belonging there. <laughs> nice. And you could get there, you know, the, I, my trick was to be silent. If you don't bug them, and you go in and sit down in the dressing room, you know, who's gonna bother you? I've, ha I've had them, tell me to get the f out, only like at Led Zeppelin, and I refused. I, <laughs> then he came, then, then they came back, uh, Percy, the singer, looked up and went, who's that? Richard, Richard Cole was our road manager, and he came over and he said, uh, could I ask you please leave? I said, since you put it like that, of course. <laughs> I did that to the Allman Brothers, it, the Who, Rolling Stones, <laughs> you, you know, you name it. Hey, uh, I'm sorry, I have one more. Yeah. No, 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 one question. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, my sister and I are huge fans of the uh, 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 Matthew Sweet Girlfriend album. And so she yeah. had a question, which is that, how did you guys come up with the different uh, guitar parts for that album? Was that a collaborative thing between you and Matthew Sweet, or was it more Little you? Bit. Yeah. No, Matthew would write the songs on his own and then send me demos. Oh. And I wouldn't listen to them. <laughs> and then, then you'd fly somewhere and to go to the studio, and uh, by the time I knew the songs, I was back on the airplane going home. <laughs> and, and I would make a mistake, and, Ma and I would say, let me do that again, and it was like, Matthew would say no. I like your mistakes are better than other people's real stuff. Oh, yeah. Right on. <laughs> he actually said something like that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, don't be afraid to make mistakes. They're only, you know, half a step away from something brilliant. Ain't that the truth. <laughs>
So we got time for about one more question. We got a question in the back, and then we'll let Richard. Okay. We'll, we'll Hi, release him back into the wild. Hi. Hi, Richard. I'm Hi. Huge, huge. We're all huge fans. Um, you don't I, look a that huge sent, to me. Sent, sent me an what? A friend of mine sent me an interview uh, that you, were you with you and Chris Franz on stage. Oh yeah. It's really delightful. And he asked you a question. I thought maybe you could reprise for the audience. Yeah. Uh, he said, why, "Why did you take drugs?" Why did I take drugs? Yeah. Because reality is is minor, and drugs are major. And I once said, what did they teach you? And I said, they taught me the difference between a pound of flour and a pound of heroin. <laughs> Huge difference. Well, how about a pound of LSD? Humongous difference. So that's worthy of investigation if you're a chemist like me. Yeah. Oh, the things you learn at Songbirds. <laughs> yeah. It's science, man. Science. I like it. All right, y'all. Well, y'all give another big round of applause for Richard Lloyd. Yay. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. You're listening to the Songbirds Radio Hour. All right, we're going to throw it back over to Zoe. She's going to do another song, and then we got a little wrap-up, and we'll call it a night. So, Zoe. So, I'm going to let my band just jam out real quick. So, we're going to listen to the Vanguard. Y'all enjoying y'all selves tonight? Good, good. I'm happy y'all are. Well, they're going to play you a little something funky. I'll give this house band another big round of applause. So Zoe, what was it like? What was it like for you guys to learn? I mean, you're an R&B band, soul band, jazz band. What was it like learning punk this week? It was very interesting, but fun. It was, it was interesting, but fun. The timing is a lot different than what we're used to. So it was something to learn with making sure we're on time, and it was, it was fun, though. We had a lot, a lot of good time, real good time. And Richard is amazing. Y'all killed so. it. Give him another round of applause. Hey. So as we bring this episode home to roost, I would like to leave you with this. Proto-punk bands like Television, along with groups like The Talking Heads, Devo, T-Rex, Death, and Patti Smith, set the mold for punk and paved the way for bands like Black Flag, Gang of Four, Wire, The Dead Boys, Stiff Little Finger, The Damned, The Runaways, The Dead Kennedys, The Sex Pistols, The Clash, and hundreds of other punk bands. They helped usher in a new form of music that bombarded the senses, overturned the status quo, and lambasted the establishment. Their nonconformist and anti-establishment ideologies changed the face of music. But they couldn't have done it without the electric guitar. That simple machine that at that time was still in its teenage years gave the punk movement a voice, and a voice that was loud as hell. And just like punk rock, the guitar is the backbone of everything we do here at Songbirds. These unique vintage guitars that surround us gave us a reason to build this museum. The thousands of guitars that we give away each year through our Guitars for Kids program give us a purpose. And those guitars give voice to thousands of students who would otherwise be without. These kids are the future of music, and it is our hope that like the long line of punk rockers before them, they will use these guitars as a soapbox to voice dissent 
or as an outlet of frustration or to express their identity or more simply to put their mark on the world. As Patti Smith once said, people have the power to redeem the work of fools. We wholeheartedly agree with this sentiment, but we might tweak it a bit to read the guitar has the power to redeem the work of fools. So this week, take the time to set down your devices, put on your favorite punk album, grab your guitar, or simply make a drum set out of an old, some old pots and pans and raise some hell. That's our show for tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks to Richard Lloyd, Zoe in the Vanguard. Well, that's our show. Give it up. Take it away, Zoe. We've got two episodes coming up next month. Jody Stevens from Big Star will be our guest on November 14th. And the dance rock group The Slants will reunite to perform on our November 15th show. Also, The Slants will perform a full benefit concert for our Guitars for Kids program following the radio hour on the 15th. Follow us on social media to keep up to date on shows and concerts at Songbirds Foundation. Songbirds Radio Hour is made possible through a grant from the Riverview Foundation. We are produced and written by Reed Caldwell and Charlie Moss. Live recording by James Snyder. Mix and master by Dran Michael Lewis. Our logo was designed by Mars Michael and our set was created with help from Alice Heinsen. Additional thanks to Adam Gann and Ray Bassett. Directed and edited by John Dooley.